The arrest of the Yorkshire Ripper, who murdered 13 women, ended Britain's biggest police operation ever. Police, desperate to nail the serial killer, had been hunting for a man from Wearside. He'd sneered at them in a tape recording that was broadcast across the nation. I'm Jack. I say you are still having no look catching me. It became the most infamous voice in Britain. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But, Lord, the only time they came near catching me was a few months back in Travelgown. But the police were victims of a hoax which led them away from the real killer. This was not the voice of the Ripper as they believed, it was the Ripper hoaxer. 20 years on, his identity and motive still remain a mystery. A solitary man with a Wearside connection records a sinister message claiming to be the brutal serial killer who's terrorised the north of England for three and a half years. I'm not quite sure when I strike again, but it will definitely be sometime this year, maybe September, October, even sooner if I get the chance. At the end of his macabre warning, he records a track from a hit record. Hope you like the catchy tune at the end. Thank you for being a friend. Travel down a road and back again. This is a personal message to the head of the Ripper investigation. By the time it arrives, the Ripper will have murdered ten women and attempted to kill seven others. The police have already received three letters signed Jack the Ripper. I hope it always will stay this way. Saliva on the envelope yields a clue that helps convince the police the tape's genuine. They're sure if they trace whoever recorded it, they'll have found the country's most notorious serial killer. The tape recording launched an 18-month-long search for the wrong man in the wrong place. When police finally arrested Peter Sutcliffe in Sheffield, they realised their hunt for the man with the strong Wearside accent had been a dreadful mistake. It derailed the investigation and allowed the mass murderer to kill again. Peter Sutcliffe is today serving life imprisonment in Broadmoor Hospital. The hoaxer has never been caught. But who was he? Was he mad? Was he evil? And was he perhaps also a killer? Sutcliffe's last victim was a Middlesbrough girl, Jacqueline Hill, a student at Leeds University. In 1981, her mother blamed the hoaxer, as well as the Ripper, for Jacqueline's death. That man has a lot to answer for. He's obviously got quite a few deaths on his conscience for the rest of his life. Do you believe that if he hadn't sent that tape and hadn't made those letters, Jacqueline could be alive today? I'm sure of it. Hello, news desk. Patrick Lavelle, too, would like to solve the mystery of the hoaxer. He's an investigative journalist in Sunderland who went undercover to research a book he's written about the hoaxer. I think the story about the hoax is important because the man has still, has still not been caught after 20 years. And his hoax letters and tape really sent the police on a wild goose chase looking for a wearside man when, at the end of the day, the Yorkshire Ripper was a man from Bradford. There was also the human cost to take into consideration because even though the publicity around the hoax was about a million pound, three women uh, lost their lives needlessly. The Yorkshire Ripper had been killing for more than three years when the hoaxer's tape was played to the public in June 1979. Like Jack the Ripper a hundred years before, his targets were prostitutes, but he made mistakes. His victims included a student and a building society clerk. Other women had survived his attacks and given descriptions of the murderer. Operating at night in solitary places, 
he left little forensic evidence in unpredictable attacks. He roamed red light areas and killed in back streets from Leeds to Bradford, Halifax, Huddersfield and Manchester. The North East had escaped his perverted slaughter, but women everywhere were terrified. Everybody's really frightened about it. <laughs> well, I think it's about time he was caught. It's very, you know, worrying for all the, for all the women that live here. You know, I think it's, it's terrible. They're a bit frightened to go out. The man leading the hunt was West Yorkshire Assistant Chief Constable George Oldfield. I have always held the view that this man will continue to kill until he is caught. No woman is safe whilst he's at large. We're doing our best. We want him as much as you do. More so. By 1979, police thought they had a profile of the Ripper gleaned from forensic evidence or from survivors. They believed he was between 20 and 42, about 5 feet 8 inches tall, with size 7 feet. He could have been a lorry driver with engineering connections who mixed with prostitutes. Extensive inquiries throughout West Yorkshire and Lancashire had led nowhere. While entire communities lived in fear, the police were under immense pressure to solve the case. They tried everything and were desperate for a new lead. When the first letters arrived postmarked Sunderland in March 1978, police reserved judgment. When the third one arrived a year later, they took it much more seriously. What clinched it? for George Oldfield and other senior investigating officers from West Yorkshire was the third letter. In the third letter, the hoaxer said something which, according to George Oldfield, had never been made public before. He mentioned the fact that he had met Viva Millward, a prostitute who, in fact, was a victim of the Yorkshire Ripper. And he said in the letter that uh, Viva Millward had told him that she had had treatment at a certain local hospital. Police looked into that. They looked into the hospital records and they found that in fact, Vera Millward had had treatment at that hospital as the hoaxer had said. As one of the Ripper Squad officers told me, George Oldfield went for it then, hook, line and sinker. Forensic tests were carried out on the letters and envelopes. They revealed what police thought was an important clue. Whoever had licked the envelopes to seal them had a rare blood group, which only 7% of the population shares. He was a bee secretor. Finally, the tape arrived in an envelope with the same handwriting and the same postmark, Sunderland. Speech experts were called in to identify the distinctive accent. It was a Wearside voice, specifically Castletown in North Sunderland. You're good looking for fingerprints. You should know by now. It's plain as a whistle. The leads the police had longed for were pointing in the same direction, Wearside. As far as George Oldfield was concerned, the man who signed himself Jack the Ripper probably was the Ripper. Before, we know we've been looking for a man and there are literally millions, and we didn't know where he came from. But now that we can localise the area, the field is not appreciably, as I'm sure you must uh, agree. The decision to move the inquiry to the northeast proved to be one of the worst blunders of modern policing. It was a mistake that Peter Sutcliffe himself would later describe as a kind of divine intervention, and it left him free to kill three more women. Almost overnight, the hunt for the Ripper switched from West Yorkshire, where most of the victims died, to Wearside. A speech expert had said the voice on a tape sent to the Ripper investigation had a Castletown accent. Letters with inside information about victims had Sunderland postmarks. Other evidence suggested he could be a lorry driver who travelled around the north of England. 
Detectives moved into a police house in Townend Farm and set up their local operation headquarters. One million pounds was spent publicizing the tape and letters, and appeals were made to the public. We arrived on the inquiry uh, on Tuesday. And the hunt for the Ripper and the hoaxer were now one and the same. The challenge is out to the public now because here we have a situation where uh, we've got an identifiable, uh, identifiable uh, voice on a tape and one would hope that the public will respond, particularly in the northeast, as I know they will do, to tell us who this man is. A Ripper hotline was set up and inundated with calls from people who thought they recognised the hoaxer's voice. Somebody you know? You think it is? One of the detectives drafted in now works for a security business and can't be identified. But he vividly recalls his 18 months on the case. I was sat at my desk one day and um, an inspector came in and just turned around and said, you're on the inquiry, get yourselves way along. And it was a matter of just you, you and you um, straight along to the inquiry. The inquiry was, was vast and um, there were numerous uh, people to see. Um, but the Castle Town and Hilton Castle, that area, it had, it had to be done house to house. Do you have any samples of your, of your normal style of writing? There was also the um, rather unpleasant business of the saliva test too. There was. Um, uh, myself and another colleague were given that uh, daunting task. And uh, it was for illiterate people, people who couldn't provide us uh, with the handwriting sample, um, of which, as you probably know, there are many. Um, and it was all, all it was, we knew that the, uh, the man writing the letters was a bee secreter and it was only a few percent of the population and obviously the, the, to take the saliva was to eliminate them from the inquiry. It caused a great deal of anxiety and unrest. The police, as you will be aware, interviewed a lot of people and they used to turn up at people's homes or make arrangements to interview them and these people were clearly worried worried in case mistakes were made and they were labelled. But, as you will probably gather, it set family upon family, neighbour upon neighbour, accusations were being flung here, there and everywhere, and it even caused a number of matrimonial disputes. Wives who really thought their husbands uh, were involved. The suggestions that he was definitely somewhere um, be being in contact with a with a prostitute or otherwise, and then to murder her was just just unbelievable. I think that this was where I came under suspicion. I was mobile. I'd been in the Leeds and Bradford area, and um, I wasn't contactable at work for various periods of time. They needed some writing, which, as I say, the only writing we could get him for the policeman was this love letter that I had from when my husband was deep sea. Um, I felt it was a total intrusion on our privacy to think that they obviously knew enough to be able to come to him and to speak to him and think that he was guilty of it. It was quite a frightening experience that um, I should become so involved in an inquiry so far as to giving samples of handwriting and samples of my shoes. Um, and getting into that depth of the inquiry, it got a bit frightening in the end. Elsewhere in the country, men with Geordie or Wearside accents were interviewed. Twenty years later, some of them are still bitter about their ordeal. Well, I lived in Bradford at the time, um, and I used to have my own coal business, delivering coal actually around the Huddersfield, Halifax area. And it was one of my customers actually phoned the police and said that I looked like the Ripper. And that was when I first started getting arrested for it. I was interviewed 14 times by different police forces. Huddersfield, Halifax, most, most of all Bradford. The actual description that they had for the hoaxer actually fitted me at the time. The gap between the teeth, the broad Geordie accent, a lorry driver. You know, I was a lorry driver. I drove a wagon day in, day out around the areas where the murders were committed. And the police just wouldn't give up. One, you know, it was just time after time after time. You know, I moved, I moved twice to get away from it all. But even as I moved, they moved with us and the police followed me wherever I went. People knew that I'd been arrested, 
And I mean, you see, you walk down the street and you see somebody looking, you think, well, what they're saying about us now? You know, it just didn't give up. It went on time after time after time. And I thought it was never, ever going to end. In addition to personal anger, there was offence at the way Castletown was portrayed nationally. Some people were more upset by the press than the police. They, they came interviewing people, I believe, in the, uh, the workmen's club or thereabouts, and um, they explained in the press that the people of Castletown, they, they did know how to dress. They were more interested in beer, pigeons and whippets. And uh, they worked about with flat caps and didn't know how to wear a tie. And quite honestly, that was very upsetting for the people of Castledown. I mean, our class people in Castledown is the salt of the earth like anywhere else. Police were swamped and struggled to keep up with the information that was pouring in. These were pre-computer days and there was a welter of cross-referenced index cards. It was taking a huge amount of time and resources. Not all the police were convinced it was worth it. The Northumbria senior officers um, weren't convinced. Um, unfortunately, West Yorkshire were. Uh, they were 100% behind the fact that the, uh, the murderer and the letter writer were one and the same. But my senior officers weren't, and we were too used to be told regularly that they weren't, and that if the, the Ripper ever was caught and he was the handwriter, and he was the man on the tape, it was a bonus. In their desperation to find a lead, the police went to extraordinary lengths. They checked every item of mail posted in Sunderland. They checked the birth records of every male aged between 20 and 42 born in Castletown. And they even scoured the local libraries looking for readers with an avid interest in crime. One name on the files stood out. Someone who took out true crime books week after week. They traced S. Smith to a house just one mile from Castletown. Well, I opened the door and there was two detectives identified themselves and they said they were making inquiries. They wanted to see S. Smith about the Yorkshire Ripper tapes, so I brought them in. And I said, why the Yorkshire Ripper tapes? What brought you here? He said, well, we've been through the library service and we found that S. Smith gets lots and lots of true crime out and we want to interview your husband. And I just laughed. I says, I'm the S. Smith that gets the books out. So he says, well, we still have to interview your husband. I don't think anyone would like to see the same thing happen at their door, to think that the husband that they'd lived with all these years was under suspicion of being a mass murderer. Terrible. Well, as I said to the detective, um, you really must be scraping the bottom of the barrel to go into the library service. He said we'd just pursue in any line of inquiry, anything to do with crime. We're following it up in any way we can to try and catch this man. Another line of inquiry led to John Gaffney, a part-time singer on the working men's club circuit. A keen artist, he sketched on beer mats as he waited for his spot. He drew hundreds of people, sometimes without them knowing. I used to sketch lorry driver in the pub in Park Lane. And uh, a lot of the drawings were strangers. So when the police came and asked if I had been sketching in the Park Lane pub in Sunderland and other pubs, and I said yes. And I said, well, could, I have a, could we have a look at the drawings? So I, I got the box out. And they said to mind if we take them away and we'll bring them back. You know, so I said, yeah, take them away. And they brought them back, but they kept about seven or eight. They were getting at any angle they could. All sorts of things was going through my mind, you know. Have I sketched somebody I shouldn't have? Uh, could they sue us for privacy and all this? Thing. But increasingly, doubts were voiced about whether the hoaxer really was the Ripper. At the minute I'm going. I should be in the book of records. Ripper survivor Olive Smelt couldn't recognise the voice. I said all along, he's not a Geordie. The man who spoke to me was a Yorkshireman. They really believed he was a Geordie. And I said, when you meet this man, if it's him who spoke to me, you will get a shock. You are no nearer catching me now than four years ago when I started. 
Even the voice expert, who'd pinpointed a Castletown accent, was unhappy about the way the inquiry was run. They were telling everybody, look for a, a northeastern accent. And we felt that they really ought to look for the murderer and the man who had sent the tape. And if it proved to be the same thing, well and good, but that it may well not be. The hunt for the Ripper and the hoaxer together lasted 18 months and the terror continued as more women died. When he was finally arrested in January 1981 in Sheffield, detectives' delight about catching Peter Sutcliffe eclipsed their embarrassment about the hoaxer. Sutcliffe came from Bradford. He had a heavy Yorkshire accent. He had no Wearside connection. He'd written no letters and recorded no tape. Basically, they were, they were totally wrong. They concentrated all the efforts in the northeast for that last 18 months. Um, the majority of the men were up here. They'd left skeleton staffs down in uh, West Yorkshire. And um, I honestly believe that three lives were taken, that if West Yorkshire hadn't been so single-minded, uh, they could have been prevented. The man could have been arrested long before he was. When Peter Sutcliffe was given a life sentence, Mr Justice Borum said the scent was falsified by a cynical, almost inhuman hoaxer. I hope that one day he may be exposed. The mystery of the hoaxer's identity has haunted police for two decades. There was one theory that he was a disgruntled police officer with a grudge against George Oldfield, the man who led the investigation for most of the time. But a police inquiry ruled that out. But there's another theory that the hoaxer was a murderer. In one of his letters, he refers to Joan Harrison, who was murdered in Preston in 1975. Whoever murdered her belonged to the B Secreta blood group, the same blood group as the man who sent the letters. Could the hoaxer and Joan Harrison's murderer be one and the same man? The reason why he mentioned the Joan Harrison murder in the earlier letters was probably because he wanted to shift the blame for that killing from himself to Peter Sutcliffe. At the time of the murder down at Preston, there wasn't a great lot in the papers in the North East, so it's not the sort of thing that um, would have been easily available to anyone living in the North East. So the, the, the feeling was, yes, um, he, he could have been responsible, and as you know, that still remains undetected. Peter Sutcliffe has always denied killing this woman or having anything to do with the actual murder. And that murder, to this day, like the hoax, is still unsolved. If the hoaxer hasn't died or been in prison for other crimes, he's still out there somewhere. He has a lot to answer for, not least the deaths of three innocent women and the murder, possibly, of a fourth. Two decades on, his chilling, mocking voice still haunts us. I'm Jack. I say you are still having no look at in me. I have the greatest respect for you, George. But Lord, the only time you came near touching me was a few months back in Travel Town. You are no near touching me now than four years ago when I started.